We have been in a series, A Christ Follower Is, and we've been looking at those non-negotiable, essential traits of a follower of Jesus. And that it's different what we're looking at. These are traits that God expects us to have. <clears throat> God desires for these to be true. in our lives if we truly are a follower of Jesus Christ. Today we get to look at one that's again an essential, it's non-negotiable, and it's a no-brainer, the one that we're going to look at today. Let me just introduce it though, but there are two motives to this one. And what we're going to look at today is being a contagious follower of Jesus Christ. Contagious, infected with a disease. Are you infected with this disease that we're going to talk about for a few minutes today? Because if you are, then you are a Christ follower. You're very much tuned in to what it means to be a follower of Jesus Christ. But before we get there, there's two motives that would cause us to consider this today, to become a contagious follower of Jesus Christ. Number one is Jesus commanded us to be. Amen. In Matthew, the very last words Jesus spoke before he ascended into heaven, he said, All authority has been given unto me, both in heaven and on earth. Therefore, go and make disciples, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, teaching them whatsoever things I have commanded you, and, lo, I will be with you as you do that. Amen? And so the first motive for being a contagious Christian is that God, Jesus, commanded us to do that, to share his good news. But that's external. But there's also an internal motivation to being contagious. And that is people who are followers of Jesus Christ, no matter the excuses that we may come up with or the hesitation we may have in sharing the good news, most of us really do want to really share our faith in Jesus Christ. Amen? Amen? Most of us really do. And we know, we recognize that it's winsome and, it, and that it's confident to be able to share our faith in Jesus Christ. We might not be sure how to do it. There might be times when we're afraid to take the risk. But deep down, we know that there isn't anything, and, and boy, do I know this, and you do too if you've ever been there, when someone heard you share the good news of Jesus Christ and they repented of their sin and turned and received Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. You know what I'm about to say. Outside of uh, the joy of your salvation, there is no greater joy than being in the presence of someone that was lost in their sin, separated from God because of their sin, on the road to hell, and you, God, used to share the truth, the good news, the story of Jesus Christ and what Jesus has done in your life and you shared what how they could have forgiveness for their sin through a faith in Jesus Christ you know there's nothing more exciting and rewarding as that amen amen a few of you had that experience it sounds like I hope many more of you will have that experience because it's what God's called us to do and to be about and it's wonderful to be able to share with a person the love of God and the truth of God the truth of Jesus and it come to reality in their lives. Deep down, Christ followers want to be contagious. They want to be contagious. Now, contagious, I looked up the definition of contagious. And, and we're living in a pandemic time, and, and so it has a negative connotation in this season that we're in, uh, being contagious. Uh, but it doesn't necessarily just mean something negative. Um, the word means transmiss transmissible by direct or indirect contact with an infected person. And so we've been hearing, you know, all through this COVID virus, you know, uh, folks are getting conta get contagious. They get infected with the virus. And uh, we want to we stay away from them when we know that they are infected with the virus. And so it has that negative connotation in what we're going through physically right now with the COVID virus with diseases it's true but the word can also be used in good ways amen such as contagious laughter let me hear that from you right now can you give me some contagious laughter come on there you go contagious laughter 
contagious faith. So those are good ways to hear the word contagious. Amen? And so today I want you to think about it in a good term, in a good way. Not the negative way in which we've been hearing with the COVID virus and the pandemic. And as we think about what a Christ follower is, again, today's trait is that a Christ follower is contagious in sharing their faith and sharing the good news of Jesus Christ with a lost person. And it's a good disease to have, amen? Unlike the virus, the COVID virus, it's a good disease. So here's my question for you to consider today. Are you infected? Are you infected? Are you contagious as a follower of Jesus Christ? You see, some Christians, there's two kinds of Christians in the world today, in churches today. Some Christians are like a magnet. And you put some iron filings down on the table, and what, what are those iron, and the magnet's right there. What do those iron filings do? Man, they'd go, they'd go right to the magnet. Some Christians are like that. There's some Christians, I know some of those like that, where they, uh, they, their life and their faith in Jesus Christ is so attractive and so drawing that people just love to come around them because their faith in Jesus and them sharing Jesus is so powerful and so strong. But then there's others that I would call vaccination Christians. <laughs> there are those Christians who kind of vaccinate people against the gospel. They, for example, a person finds out, you mean he is a Christian? Are you kidding me? If he's a Christian, I don't want to have anything to do with that. I call that a vaccination Christian that actually keeps someone away from putting their faith and their trust in Jesus Christ because of the way in which they live their life. And we're going to look at that in just a moment. So there's two different kinds of Christians, basically. Uh, today we want to look at the symptoms of the disease. Every disease has symptoms. We've been learning about those this, over the past two years. Well, it seems like two years almost uh, with the virus, with the pandemic. Uh, we want to look at the symptoms of the disease of being a contagious follower of Jesus Christ and how can we become infected? How can we become infected with it? Uh, a follower of Jesus shares the good news about Jesus. Again, that is the trait that we're looking at today. Some people will call that evangelism or evangelistic. I tend to stay away from that word because as soon as I said that word, some of you had already turned me off because you knew that's what we're going to be talking about. But God has called us to be evangelistic, and that is a trait of being a true, genuine follower of Jesus Christ, that you will be evangelistic. And so I want us to look at it in the, in the sense that I'm talking about of sharing the good news of Jesus Christ, because that's really what evangelism means. The word evangelism is to proclaim, to proclaim the good news. And so let's look at what are the symptoms. But two things have to happen as we look at these symptoms in your life, in my life, and in the church's life. We already know one of those that here at Gallman Baptist Church, we have to start doing some things differently. In fact, you'll be praying for our church leadership tonight because we're going to begin talking about some things that are going to have to be done differently if we are going to be a disciple-making church. If we're going to grow disciples that make disciples, we're going to be changing some things. We're going to be doing things differently because we're going to get back to the Great Commission that I just shared with you at the beginning of the message. Jesus said, all authority has been given unto me both in heaven and on earth. And then he gave the command to you and to me, go and make disciples. And so we're going to look at that as a church as well. But leadership's going to begin looking at that. Uh, so we do have to understand that there's some things that we're going to have to do differently. We have to realize that and we have to be ready for that and accept that. Secondly, our attitude about people has to change. <laughs> Let me say that again. Our attitude about people has to change. So that what? We begin to care for people in the same way that Jesus cared for people. Amen? So let's look at these symptoms. Number one, they'll be on the screen. I invite you to jot these down so you can look in your own life to see if you have these symptoms and see if you're infected with this disease of being a contagious follower of Jesus Christ. Number one... 
a contagious follower of Jesus will have the understanding in the heart that all people matter to God. Not just physically, but all people matter to God eternally as well. One day while Jesus was teaching here in Luke 15, he found himself surrounded by this growing crowd. Look at the text. I'm not going to read the whole chapter. He's found himself surrounded by this growing crowd of unacceptable people. Notice, people are uh, skeptical people, uh, confused, morally corrupt people were gathering around Jesus Christ. And off to the side, there were these religious leaders. And these religious leaders were mumbling and grumbling and complaining about Jesus Christ because, let me read it. Now the tax collectors and sinners were all drawing near to him, and the Pharisees and the scribes, the church-going people, grumbled, saying, This man receives sinners and eats with them. And Jesus, upon hearing this, grumbling and complaining, he shifts gears. Notice, he changes direction, and he begins to tell them three stories. He tells them the story of the shepherd who loses one sheep, the story of a woman who loses a coin, and a lost son or the prodigal son who gets his inheritance from his father and goes off and squanders that inheritance. And then finally he comes to his senses and returns to the father. And so here you have these three stories. And let me remind you, if Jesus says something once, that's probably important. If Jesus says it twice, sit up and listen. But if Jesus says something three times, I think you get the idea. It's non-negotiable. It's essential for you and for me as a follower of Jesus Christ. So he shows us that people who have wandered or missing or lost, the first thing I want you to notice in these three stories, they have great value to God the Father. They have great value. That shepherd, that sheep didn't plan to go off and stray, and that sheep didn't come back on his own. The shepherd had to go out and find that lost sheep. So the shepherd leaves the 99 and goes and gets the one, finds the one. So you see that with the woman in the lost coin. She's lost the coin. She had 10. She's lost one, and she literally turns the house upside down trying to find that one lost coin. And then, of course, the prodigal son who got his inheritance from the father. He was not happy, evidently, and he wanted to go off on his own. And he went off, and, of course, the story is he squandered that inheritance. He began eating out of pig trough, pig food. And finally, the Scripture says he came to his senses, and he came back. But I want you to know something about the father. Jewish, in Jewish day, in that day, Jewish fathers wore a robe. And I want you to understand in that picture of the prodigal son, the father wasn't sitting in his recliner the whole time that his son was missing. He was concerned about his son being gone. He was concerned about what may be happening in his son's life. And so picture, if you would, Jesus, Jesus, the, the father is standing at the end of his, his uh, where his uh, house is, so to speak, and he's looking out. He's, he's surveying, watching for, looking for his son. And then when he sees his son coming, what does the father do? He has to pull up that robe that he wears, and he runs to the son. Amen? He runs to the son and embraces the son and says, we, you are forgiven, son. And then he calls everybody together to celebrate. The son that was once lost is now found. And so you have in this story that Jesus shows us that people who have wandered away, that are missing, that are lost, they are valuable to the Heavenly Father. They matter to him. Lost people matter to God, and they really ought to matter to you and to me as well, to us. Do they? Do they? You don't have to answer that. That's for you to reflect on. Do lost people matter in your life? They ought to. Their eternal destiny ought to matter 
every single day that you walk on this planet as a believer, as a follower in the Lord Jesus Christ. But my greatest fear is that we got too many followers of Jesus Christ or say they're followers of Jesus Christ that don't have that sense of the value of every person that's lost without Jesus and what God's calling you to do when he brings that individual into your pathway, into your life. Amen? Because God wants you to share the good news. Amen? We got good news to share. Jesus Christ. And yet we got too many closed-lipped Christians we got closet Christians. We got cannibal Christians. We got, uh, I, I could go on and on. We got all kinds of Christians that aren't following and being obedient to the command that Jesus gave us. Where are you with that command to go and share the good news of Jesus Christ and make disciples of Jesus Christ? You see, Jesus, in this three stories, he also tells us why. We should consider why people are lost before we go to them. We should consider why they're lost. The shepherd considered why the sheep had strayed away. Again, the sheep didn't make a decision to do that one day and had planned it out. And so the shepherd had to think about why did that sheep stray. Uh, the woman, you know, she had to think about what did she do that caused the coin to be lost. Why was the coin lost? And then the father, I'm sure, had moments where he considered or thought about why did my son want to do this? Why did my son want to wander away? And you understand all these stories is a picture of God the Father and us. We find ourselves in the sheep and the lost coin and the prodigal son or the lost son. And so you have in these three stories why people are lost. Jesus, I think, is telling us these, these stories so that we think about why people are lost before we go get them. And then thirdly, we live in a day with the Hurricane Ida, for example, re uh, search and rescue teams have been at work in, down in Louisiana and other parts. We had the same thing here, a search and rescue, an all-out search by the shepherd, by the woman, for what was missing, the father waiting to see his son return see Jesus is telling us that we're on a search and rescue mission amen if you're a follower of Jesus Christ you're on a search and rescue mission you're part of the search and rescue team with Jesus Christ lastly being found if you notice in the stories we didn't read them but if you notice in the stories what happened at the very end of all of them There was great rejoicing. <laughs> there was great, great rejoicing. In the case of the prodigal son, there was a big old party thrown. But all three, once what was lost was found, there was a celebration unlike you can ever imagine. And in heaven, it, the scripture tells us, look down in verse, um, for I have found my sheep that was lost. Rejoice with me, for I found my sheep that was lost. Just so I tell you that where there be more joy in heaven over one sinner who repents than over 99 righteous persons, that's church-going people, who need no repentance, or religious people who think they need no repentance, I should say. And so there's great rejoicing. There's, they found what was found brought great joy, and that ought to be true in your life and my life every time. Uh, every moment, and the scripture knows, don't you think about this, at that moment in your life, when you put your faith and your trust in what Jesus did for you on the cross, in that very moment, and you received Jesus Christ into your life, the scripture tells us that all heaven erupted in joy. Amen? I want you to think about that moment. Some of you need to get a hold of that again. In that moment, in that very moment, all of heaven, come on, church people, all of heaven rejoiced in your salvation, in you coming to faith in Jesus Christ. And there was a cosmic celebration, amen, brother, unlike heaven ever experiences except when that takes place. The scripture's telling us there, every time a sinner comes to know Jesus Christ as we as followers of Jesus Christ 
are faithful in sharing the good news with them and God's brought their heart ready to receive that good news and put their faith and trust in Jesus Christ. Come on, listen to me, folks. Every time there is a cosmic celebration in heaven, just like the time you did. Wow. And we ought to rejoice every time and have that same sense of celebration that happens in heaven when you were honored and when a sinner is honored that comes to faith in Jesus Christ. That's how much your Heavenly Father values you. Amen? Got to get a hold of that today because that's the number one symptom of being infected as a contagious follower of Jesus Christ. You got to realize and understand that all people matter to God. Their eternal destiny matters to Him and it ought to matter to us as well. He loves you. Amen? And you ought to be, feel honored. He values you. He chased you. Amen. You didn't go, you didn't find God. I didn't find God. Jesus found us. Amen. Jesus chased after you and found you. If you have come to that place in a relationship with Jesus Christ through faith and by grace. If you think you know what joy is when Jesus found you and rescued you, just wait. Just wait until that moment that you get the opportunity again to stand face to face with someone that is not in a right relationship with God and God gives you the opportunity to share with them the good news of Jesus Christ. And that person prays, says, I want that. I want that. I remember not too long ago I was witnessing with someone and I was going on and on about here's, here's what God's done for you on the cross and the blood of Jesus Christ will take care of your takes care of your sins if you would just put your faith your trust in Jesus Christ and what he did for you on the cross and receive him and he stopped me in the middle of all that and he said come on I'm ready to get it done <laughs> don't you love that I, I'm ready to get it done he was ready to take care of his salvation ready to take care of his sin and that was a joyous moment that he was ready to do that and he did so it's going to be a wonderful experience when you get to do that. Some of you have already had that. Some of you haven't. God wants to see you experience that. I believe he's going to give you those opportunities out of this series as we're learning what it means to be a follower of Jesus Christ. That's a follower of Jesus Christ. People's eternity matters to him because it matters to God. Second symptom of a contagious follower of Jesus, the way you live makes the gospel attractive. The way that you live your life makes the gospel attractive. Turn over, flip back to Matthew chapter 5. Our D groups are going through Matthew chapter 5. And so our guys and the ladies, you'll, you'll recognize these verses we're going to look at. Look at verse 13 and through 16 of Matthew 5. It's the Sermon on the Mount. Jesus is preaching here. Look what he says, verse 13. You are the salt of the earth. Talking about followers of Jesus. But if salt has lost its taste, lost its identity, how shall its saltiness be restored? It is no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trampled under people's feet. You are the light of the world. A city set on a hill cannot be hidden. Nor do people light a lamp and put it under a basket, but on a stand, and it gives light to all in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before others, especially those that are lost, so that they may see your good works, not so you can boast about those good works, but so that you can boast about God bringing about those good works through you and give glory to your Father who is in heaven second symptom of a contagious follower of Jesus Christ is the way you live your life makes the gospel attractive. There's two pictures here in this, these verses that Jesus speaks here. Two pictures of, you, of us as the church and two pictures individually of us. That is salt and light. How many love to eat popcorn? Can you raise your hand? How many love to eat popcorn? Man, I, 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 if I could, I'd eat it every day. I love popcorn. But you know, Popcorn also, we put salt on the popcorn, and, and before you know it, uh, what, what happens? You get, th you get real thirsty. 
the more you eat it. And it's true of other foods, too, when you put salt on them. You know, salt is a preservative. It provides flavor. Uh, and at the same time, you know, salt changes things. Amen? Whatever maybe you didn't like, you put a little salt on it, and it begins to be more palatable to you, more enjoyable to you. Amen? Like a good old steak. I, I, I hesitate to even say that because some of you now are going to be thinking about lunch um, and what you're going to eat for lunch today. But, but think about it. Two pictures here of you and of the church. Salt and light. Both. Per, salt permeates whatever you put it on. Light, whatever you let it into, it changes things. The light changes things. Changes the darkness. And then there's a third picture over in 2 Corinthians chapter 2. You don't have to turn there. I believe I put it on the screen for you. Is the picture of perfume. That you're to be like perfume. Amen. Where God speaks of using us to spread the aroma of the knowledge of Jesus everywhere we are. Amen. It says that in 2 Corinthians chapter 2 verses 14 and 15. Everywhere we are, we're to be the fragrance of Christ for God. So how are you smelling today? <laughs> because he goes on to say the fragrance can be a stink fragrance to those that are not dead to their sin and alive to faith in Jesus Christ, but it can be a pleasant, a pleasant aroma to those that are dead to their sin and alive to Christ through faith in him. Amen? So where are you with that? Are you a... Are you a fragrant aroma to those that are lost? Are you a pleasant aroma or are you a stink to those that are lost? Hear what Jesus, is, what Paul's saying there. A contagious Christian, the way you live your life makes the gospel appealing. It's not repulsive. As I shared the two Christian, two examples of two Christians, the vaccination Christian would be an example of a Christian who causes by the fact that their life is not being attracted, showing the attractiveness of the gospel, they're, they're living contrary to the gospel during the week, then they come on Sunday and pretend to be, but guess what? Lost people are watching us all the time, amen? Come on, church. Lost people are watching us all the time. And so we better be sure that we are walking in a way that our lives attract people to the gospel of Jesus Christ. Now, now hear me here. Uh, the way we live is to be attractive, not repulsive. And, and what Jesus, is, what Paul is emphasizing with these three things, that we're salt and light and we're a fragrant perfume, he's describing for us that we are not to be repulsive, but we're to be different. We're to be distinct as a Christian. We're to be, as a follower of Jesus Christ, our lifestyle is to be redemptive in every sense of the word. At times, and I, and I, at times in my pastoral ministry, I was thinking about that this week, I've had people talk with me about people in the church. <laughs> and if you've been pastor long enough, you end up getting members of the church that will come to you about other members in the church. Amen? And over my time in pastoral ministry, I've had many conversations with church members talking about other people in the church. Sometimes they complain about that person. And when I have those conversations outside of this ch of a church building, the person says, you mean that person goes to your church? You mean that person goes to your church? This is what they did to me. They're my neighbor. And they're the worst neighbors I've ever had. And they claim to be a follower of Jesus Christ. They claim to be a Christian. Folks, that makes it really tough to share the gospel when you experience people like that that have not been attracted to the gospel by another Christian because that Christian was not living in a way that made the gospel attractive and appealing to that person. Amen? We're to be salt. We're to make people thirsty, to want to know what, what's making you so different, what's making you, what's making you so distinct. 
salt will make you thirsty. We're supposed to make people thirsty to want to know more about the change that's come about in our lives, what Jesus has done in our lives. But folks, you can't do that if you don't open your mouth and share what Jesus is doing in your life. Amen? A closed mouth Christian is not what God's called us to be. He's called us to be public with our faith. Many Christians think that coming to Christ is a private matter. There's nothing private about it. It is public, such as Maggie going into the baptismal waters this morning. That's a public, anytime we go through baptism, it's a public acknowledgement that I don't want to be in control of my life anymore. I want Jesus to take control of my life. Amen, right, Maggie? I want Jesus to take the reins of my life and control me and lead me the way that God wants me to go. And so that's the second way. And God does, and I've got to say this, that God doesn't expect us to be perfect this side of eternity, but other people don't expect you to be perfect either. But God does, and others do expect you and me to be distinct, to be different. To be in the world, but not of the world. Where are you with that today? Of living a life that's attractive, attracts people to the gospel of Jesus Christ. Thirdly, symptom of a contagious follower of Jesus, that person works to be ready to share the gospel. They work to be ready to share the gospel. Now, it's not your fault, but it is possible, hear me, it is possible to be a Christian for decades for years to go to worship every Sunday to go to Sunday school every week to come to Wednesday night prayer meeting to be involved in WMU or Brotherhood Breakfast or whatever you want to name here it is possible to do that for decades and never have learned how to share the gospel of Jesus Christ hear me today not your fault necessarily but the point I'm trying to make is that you need to make a decision to prepare yourself be preparing yourself in how to share the gospel of Jesus Christ because most of us in this room are not going to pick up on it just by sitting in this room in a worship service you're not going to pick it up in a Sunday school class we need to be preparing ourselves through training through teaching of how to effectively share what Jesus has done in your life and then how to effectively share what the gospel of Jesus Christ is, what Jesus has done to a non-church person in a way that they could understand. Because we have a tendency when we talk about what Jesus has done in our lives, what do we tend to use? I call it Christianese words. We use church words, amen? We use church words. I've been working with Maggie with her testimony and I want you to know that that's what you've got to do you've got to take some time to work out your testimony and she's been wonderful at doing that doing what I've asked her to do to help move her move away from using Christianese words Christ words that we use inside the church that a non-church person doesn't have a clue what you're saying what you're talking about and so there needs to be preparation first Peter I I didn't learn how to share my faith until I was in college. Hello? I went years as a new believer, as a follower of the Lord Jesus Christ, and didn't know that I needed to prepare myself, train, get trained in how to share the gospel, the good news of Jesus Christ. 1 Peter 3.15 tells us, Peter says, But in your hearts, honor Christ as holy. Always be prepared to give an answer. There's the word, be prepared to give an answer to everyone who asks you to give the reason for the hope that you have. You see, being prepared implies preparation. And in preparation implies what? Work. You've got to work at it. You've got to work at it to be ready to share the gospel. Very few people can pick it up by osmosis. Amen? There may be one or two. They can do that. Or just sitting in church to articulate your faith clearly to an unchurched person. So 
So here's my question. Are you able to tell people, number one, what Jesus has done for you in a clear way, in an understandable way to someone that maybe didn't grow up in the church? Are you able to tell people what he's done for everybody, what Jesus has done for everybody? Very few of us can do that without preparation, without training. It shouldn't surprise us that preparation is required, folks, to do the most important task on the planet. Amen? We're talking today about the most important task that God's given you, 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 and me. Not just the preachers, but every one of us. Not just the staff members, but every one of us. The most important task that God has given you and given everyone is to share the gospel, the good news of Jesus Christ with people. Number four, a contagious follower of Jesus makes sacrifices and takes risk. If you're going to be a contagious follower of Jesus Christ, then you're going to make sacrifices and take risk. I've had some situations, and I, I have to be honest with you about these, I have had a couple situations where I began to have a spiritual conversation with these individuals and got distracted and started doing other things and started getting involved in ministry during those times, during those seasons. And I'm sad to say, one of them, when I went back and wanted to share the gospel with this person and I knocked on the door, the wife came to the door and I said, well, I'm here to see Bill. I've been meaning to get with Bill and we need to finish our conversation we had last time. And she looked at me and said, Bill's died. You know how that impacted me? It made me realize that I possibly, because I didn't take seriously sharing the gospel, the good news of Jesus Christ with Bill, that Bill possibly, I was the last person that he heard from about it. And because he didn't accept Jesus as his Savior and Lord, he's in hell today because I failed to share when God gave me the opportunity because I got distracted with my life and what I thought was important <laughs> instead of the most important task for God. As we've always said, God matters. Bill mattered to God so much so that he gave Jesus as the payment for his sin, the blood of Jesus to cover his sin. And I've had it more than once happen to me, sharing the gospel with someone and I didn't do it and they've died since. You know what that's done for me? That has made me immune to the fear of offending someone with the gospel of Jesus Christ. I, I, I don't, I'm, I'm immune to that, but that's an excuse that maybe you've used. I don't want to offend the person. I've heard that Christians say that, and, and that shouldn't. You should be immune to it. Amen? Because God desires that everyone be saved, the Scripture says, that all come to repentance and faith in Him so that they will one day be in heaven when their body dies. Or I don't want to make someone uncomfortable or risk our relationship for the sake of seeing them saved and spending eternity in heaven because that's really what you're saying in that excuse. When you, you're, you don't want to make them uncomfortable or the risk losing the relationship. What's more important, <laughs> losing your relationship with that person or knowing that you've shared, you've been faithful in sharing Jesus Christ with that person and you've done what God's asked you to do, and that person accepts Christ, what's, what's better? You may lose the friendship, but guess what? That person gets to go to heaven when they die. And you're going to see them again in heaven if you too have faith in Jesus Christ. Listen to me. You know, this excuse, I don't want to turn them off to the gospel Friends, if they are not a follower of Jesus Christ, they've already turned it off. If they're not a follower of Jesus, they've already turned off to the gospel 
of Jesus Christ. And unless they get turned on, amen, I thought about it. Unless they get turned on by the gospel and activated by the Holy Spirit and, and get, that they're going to spend eternity, they can spend eternity with Jesus, guess what? They're going to spend eternity without Jesus. And it's not your doing. You're simply supposed to be the mouthpiece. I'm supposed to be the mouthpiece. God says in his word, successful witnessing is going out in the power of the Holy Spirit and sharing the good news of Jesus. Here it is. Some of you need to get it. And leave the results to God. Leave the results to God. Some of us get bent out of shape, thinking we're going to offend the person. We're going to lose the relationship. But again, that's what God wants you to do, to share Jesus every chance you get with those that matter to him and they're lost in their sin, separated for all eternity unless you tell them the good news of Jesus. Number four, a contagious follower of Jesus makes sacrifices and takes risks. Paul said it so well in 1 Corinthians, almost done. To the weak I became weak to win the weak. Listen to what Paul says. I have become all things to all people so that what? By all possible means I might save some. Of course, Paul's not saying that he's the one that saved them. He's saying that I might not be the one, that I might be the one that God would use to share the good news and they would put their faith or trust in Jesus Christ. Do you know what Paul's saying? That do whatever it takes, believer, follower of Jesus. If you're going to be contagious, follower of Jesus Christ, you do whatever it takes with whoever and whenever. Short of moral compromise. You don't want to compromise your, your morals to reach people for Jesus. But the question is, will you? Will we, as a church, as we move forward in a new direction as a church, will we as a church that's what it means to follow jesus christ lastly let me give you three quick things how can i become contagious follower of jesus christ and share jesus the good news of jesus and i want to challenge you in these three areas to do these this week start doing these this week number one pray pray weekly for two people pray weekly for just two people two people that god reveals to you that he's brought them into your life so that he can use you to share Jesus with them. So this week, will you do that? Two people. Some of you already got them on your minds right now, or they're starting to be there on your mind. Those two people, pray with them week in and week out, every single week. The truth is, folks, praying for people who don't know Jesus is half the job of salvation. Praying for people who do not know Jesus is half the job of sharing the gospel of Jesus Christ. So pray, number two, for two people. Number two, commit yourself to being trained to sharing your story. Not just sharing your story, because your story needs to be condensed. Sometimes, we, because we've not been trained, we can go on and on and on about my life. But the Three parts of a testimony is your life before Jesus came into your life. What was it like? Just briefly sharing that. And then how did you come to realize you needed Jesus Christ in your life? What was going on that God brought Jesus to your mind for the very first time, to your heart that you needed him in your life? And then the bit, most important part of the testimony, what is Jesus doing in your life right now? Amen. Well, we tend to cut that one short. Well, we don't share anything at all when we share our testimony. We do the first part and the middle part, but we leave out the last part. What is Jesus doing in your life right now? Is he moving in your life? What is he teaching you in your life? What is he showing you in your life? What scripture is he getting in your life that he wants to see it grow in your life? So commit yourself to being trained. Number three, get out of your comfort zone. <laughs> Get out of your comfort zone. Too many believers are in their comfort zone. And, and you can't blame the virus for that. You could at some point. You really can't. I've had a chance to share the gospel in a yard with the person up on the porch. 
I've had a chance to share the gospel from one gas pump all the way over to the gas pump at the other end of the station. So there's no excuse, folks, to the opportunities that God presents us to share the good news of Jesus Christ. Amen? So get out of your cocoon. Get out of your closet. Get out of your comfort zone and build relationships with people who need Jesus. Did you know that after two years, the average Christian has no non-Christian friends? Did you know that? After two years of being a Christian, they have no non-Christian friends. That ought not to be. Do you have non-Christian friends that you're building relationships with Using the image of contagious and infected, you got to be in contact with those that don't know Jesus. You got to be in close proximity with those that don't know Jesus. Jesus was. Think about Jesus. He was in relationships with all kinds of people. That's why the religious people were so upset with him all the time because he was hanging out with the non-saved people, the, those that didn't know God, that didn't want God in their life necessarily. Yet Jesus loved them. He was a friend to them. Amen? In fact, friendship is the bottleneck when it comes to sharing our faith in Jesus Christ. We need to learn how to be friends today in this culture that we're in, in this pandemic that we're in. We need to learn how to be friends and how to build relationships with those that are unchurched, those that are lost, are you with me today, folks? Because the question again is, are you infected? Are you infected with a disease? 